We continue our study through Matthew, and we begin chapter 6 this morning. And uh, so if you can turn to Matthew chapter 6, I'll read the first 18 verses, and we will then look specifically at the first uh, four verses of chapter 6. Really, as we look into the next, Jesus is now making a, starting a new subject in this Sermon on the Mount. As we remember, Jesus is in Galilee on a hill teaching his disciples. There's a, a crowd that is gathered. He is preaching this sermon, and he is teaching about the kingdom. Who are those who truly belong to the kingdom? And for those who belong to the kingdom, what does it mean to follow Jesus? What does it mean to live a life as a citizen of heaven. And Jesus is really moving now, but we had just finished the, the, the set of antitheses where Jesus is correcting uh, their understanding of the law. And now he's moving to a new challenge, and that is how do we go about obeying it? How do we live in obedience to the law? The title of the sermon today is, is called Motive, Motives Matter. Motives Matter. Proper motivation for our actions is a constant emphasis because our motives reveal our true intentions of the heart. Let's read Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 18. Matthew chapter 6. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray... Go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this. Our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, as we look now to your word and we try to discern how to live and Lord, with what motivation we live by, we are all well aware the difficulty of being single-minded and how our motives are never constant. Lord, this is why we need the power of the Holy Spirit working in us to first reveal the sin of our hearts, to give us an understanding of your word and to power us with a desire to fulfill it, to obey it, to live it out. 
Or we, we leave our lives in your hands. Lord, as I bring this sermon, I pray that you would just remove any wrong, selfish motivations that I have. My concern for how people think, how they might respond if they like my sermon or not. Lord, this, I pray that my desire would be to honor you, to worship you, that I would bring a clear sermon, a clear understanding of this passage. Hearing the sermon, the words of Jesus, is a powerful thing. Lord, I pray that you would give me the grace to handle it well and to speak the truth in love. In Jesus' name, amen. A doctor once told me that if a person wants to become a doctor, if they want to become a doctor for prestige or for money, they're never going to make it through medical school, through, through the residency program, they'll never make it. Because ultimately, if they want to be a doctor, if they want to make it, their desire must be to practice medicine. Their desire must be to help people. When I was in high school, uh, just in my first year in high school in, in the U.S., my brother, who was a couple years older, was the state champion in the 100-meter race. And he crossed the finish line, and then the cameras came from the local TV station. They want to interview him. You know, what was it like? And not being used to being interviewed, he said, it was my goal to win the 100-meter race. That was the whole interview. But what a, what a telling reality of the motivation of why, why he went to practice every day, why he endured, even competed in other events. The natural talent and the athleticism is not enough to be a champion. There must be single-mindedness to win. Motive. Motive is simply the reason for doing anything and everything. It's the reason for doing anything and everything. It doesn't describe what we are doing, it's describing why we are doing it. And the reality is, in life there are certain things that cannot be achieved unless the motive is the right one. Unless the motive is the right one. This is the principle in chapter 6, verse 1, that Jesus is getting to. In fact, verse 1 is the principle for the entire chapter. Now, I will leave in there a parenthesis for uh, the Lord's Prayer. And so, this week we're going to talk about the, the giving. Next week we're going to begin talking about prayer. We're going to pr talk about prayer for two weeks, and then we're going to have a sermon on fasting. But the principle, these are illustrations, the principle is about the motive. And today I want to ask you a question. When it comes to giving, when it comes to generosity, who are you really serving? Who are you really serving when you give? The, the rabbis in Jesus' day considered almsgiving, prayer, and fasting as the top virtuous acts of Jewish piety or devotion. And so Jesus creates a structure here. And the structure fits actually both or all three illustrations of giving, praying, and fasting. He gives the practice. He tells what not to do. He talks about the reward for doing, the, doing it the wrong way. And then he talks about how to do something correctly. And then the ultimate reward. The practice, what not to do the reward, how to do it correctly, and the ultimate reward. So as you read those 18 verses, you can see that pattern in all three of those, of those points that he's making about generosity or almsgiving, prayer, and fasting. The practice he's talking about here in the first four, four verses is giving. The other thing we have to realize about all three of these is it's assumed in the text that people do it. The observance of giving is declared righteous, it's virtuous, it is good to give, to be generous to the poor. The text assumes the listeners not only do this, but it assumes that they know it's the right thing to do. And it is the right thing to do. Generosity is the heart of God. And as citizens of the kingdom, we also should share this desire, this heart, 
in giving to others. But then Jesus goes on and says, but this is how you don't do it. This is the wrong way to go about doing it. Like the hypocrites, those leaders who go into the street and they, they announce with trumpets and make a great show and declaration so that everybody can see what they're giving and show how generous and, and pious and virtuous they are. Now, I, I don't know all of the cultural details. This could be a, a, metaf- a metaphor. Uh, we say in English, don't blow your own horn. It could also be a literal thing. They're going in the streets, maybe during festivals, and they're, they're blowing the trumpet to make an announcement that it's time to give. And when there's a crowd, they come out as leaders and they show uh, how to be the example and uh, how much more righteous they are in the hopes that people would look at them and say, wow, you truly love God more than we. You are so much more righteous than we are. And Jesus says, that's your reward. The reward for seeking the praise of others, is the praise of others. And he's saying their actions reveal their motives. The important thing to understand in this text is those hypocrites, those hypocrites received exactly what they were looking for. They were looking for the praise of others. And the reality is, although it may seem on the outside that what they were doing was an act for God, God knew their true motive. They did not receive what they were not seeking. What were they not seeking? They were not seeking a reward from God. They were looking for that quick moment of affirmation and and self-exaltation. And Jesus is saying, be careful, beware, this is a warning. Your motive determines your reward. He's not even talking about the action at the the root of what he's getting at. Your motive for what you do, no matter how righteous it looks on the outside, will determine your reward, whether it's something in this life, momentary, or whether it's something eternal that's given to us by God. And so in this warning, he gives an alternative. He says, when you give... Do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Now, we don't use that kind of language in our everyday life. Maybe if you're uh, someone who grew up around the Bible, you will use this because you understand its meaning, or maybe you use this and you don't know what it means. But what he's saying here, I don't let my left hand know what my right hand is doing, is he tries to keep it as secret as possible. You're not exposing your actions Jesus is saying, yes, you should be generous. You should, be, you should give. It is a righteous act. He says, but be secretive. What does he mean? Don't draw attention to yourself. Now, I want to make something very clear in this because if you're remembering back to chapter 5 already, you're saying, wait a minute. Didn't he say something about let your works shine in such a way that others see you? Didn't he just say that people should see you doing good works? Didn't he just say that? Why now is he saying, do it in secret? Be careful that you read the words as Jesus is teaching them. He's saying, or let me, say, let me begin by saying what he's not saying, the negative side. He is not saying, beware of your righteous acts being seen. Beware, Don't, make sure nobody sees you do good things. That's a ridiculous statement. And that statement would contradict with what Jesus said before. There are good works that are meant to be seen. They are meant to be visible. In chapter 5, he is comparing a kingdom people, the citizens of heaven, to a city on a hill, a lamp in a house. And he was saying, in the same way, like a city on a hill, like a lamp for the house, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. These two statements in chapter 5 and chapter 6 are not contradicting each other. They're really saying the same thing from two different perspectives. One's positive and one is negative. He's saying in chapter 6, Do not do your righteous acts so that you may be seen by others. That's the negative. Do not do it to be seen by others. 
And then in chapter 5, he says, let your light shine in such a way in order that they would see your good works and glorify your Father. This so that and in order to declares the motive for for kingdom-minded people, for citizens of heaven. The motive of what we do. And the, the point Jesus is getting at is who are your good works pointing people to? Who are your good works pointing people to? Jesus is not saying if people find out that you gave to somebody or that you were generous, that he's not going to reward you. Hope somebody found out you were generous. Well, that's not, that's not treasures in heaven. That's, there's no reward for that. He's not saying that. Jesus is saying, beware that your ego, beware of your ego getting in the way of God's glory. Beware of your ego and your desire to be affirmed and praised getting in the way of God's glory. We should carry over his statement that let your light shine, let your life live out, be lived out in such a way that when others see you, they see you looking looking up at God, and they walk and say, what is this person doing? What are they looking at? And they turn and they see, and they also glorify God. That is the goal. That is the aim of every believer. And Jesus is warning us of our egos, that desire to to take that glory for ourself so that we can feel good, so that we can be self-righteous, so we can prove to others that we're good enough. And the last point here is the ultimate reward. When we go about doing things for God's glory, when, we, when we're doing things uh, in a way that keeps our ego out of our actions, he says there's an ultimate reward. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now, I want to make something clear about the word rewards because we can really take this out of the context that Jesus is talking and start applying it to things that he never intended. And namely, good works do not earn your salvation. Your reward for doing good works is not salvation. Salvation comes only by faith in Jesus Christ alone. What Jesus is pointing out is our desire. Our desires, our motive for doing what we do. The ultimate reward that we get from God for serving him and following him is God himself. He rewards every believer for faithfulness. And his reward for faithfulness comes in his time and in his own way. As we fix our eyes on Jesus, the one who is our ultimate treasure, we We realize with Paul that, wow, we just pursue him and no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor entered into the heart of man the great and wonderful things that God has planned for those who love him. That he is our reward. The moment we seek our own reward, we forge an idol from the fires of our sinful flesh. And you may get what you want. That self-affirmation, that self-gratification. But it will not be the eternal reward that comes from God. Your motive will determine the outcome, your reward. Now, we're going to hear more about that when Pastor Stephen in a couple weeks begins uh, verse 19. For where your treasure is, your heart will be also. So I'm not going to steal that portion of the sermon from him. Uh, or at least his, um, his portion of Jesus' sermon. But there are a couple questions I'd like to end with to challenge us on this text, and I hope that you spend time reading over this text, talking about it. And the question is, why does God not reward self-motivated works of righteousness? Why doesn't God reward us? For good, they're good works. He declares them good, but then there's no reward if we do them for our own gratification, our self-glorification. We have to understand something about God's ultimate motive, his ultimate, his ultimate objective. His primary objective is not our good deeds. 
but it's his own glory. And when we do good deeds for selfish motives, we rob God of what is rightfully his. We take from him what belongs to him. That is the honor, the glory, the praise. In Isaiah chapter 48, verse 11, he says it very plainly. For my own sake, for my own sake, he says it twice to emphasize the point. I do it for how should my name be profaned? My glory I will not give to another. My glory I will not give to another. For my own sake, he says, and as followers of Jesus, we respond with Psalm 115 verse 1. And we turn and we say, yes, not to us, not to us, O Lord. But to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. But it's so hard to be single-minded. And if we're honest, we don't even know our own motives most of the time. It's very difficult to be single-minded in the pursuit of following Christ. Why? Because our egos love to be stroked. We, it's hard to keep our good deeds to ourselves. We just get so excited about serving the Lord. We, we see someone in need and we go and we give and oh, we're just so excited about it. And oh, I did, and you feel good. You feel good that you did that. And now I just, I want to go tell someone that I did that. We say, did you, didn't you see what I did? Hey, let me, you didn't see it? Let me, let me tell you what I did. And all of a sudden, we find ourselves taking what belongs to God and keeping it for ourselves. There's nothing more satisfying to the flesh than affirmation. And affirmation by itself is not sinful. It's not bad. It's good to be affirmed. It's good. When you're doing something right, when you know you're, am I I doing the right thing? And someone comes along and says, hey, that's a great job. That affirmation is good. It keeps us on track. It encourages us. There are people with the gift of encouragement and their job is to encourage people when they see God working in their life or want to bring them along. Encourage them. It's good to be affirmed. But affirmation is like wine. It's healthy in small doses, but too much creates addiction, dependence, and a blurred sense of reality. You know, generosity is a virtue today. I think people, people want to do good things for people. They want, to, they want to give to the poor. Although I don't think it's the top virtue of our culture today. I don't think it's, um, it's not parallel with what we see in Jesus' day amongst Israel. The higher virtues are not prayer. It's not fasting. Today in our culture, the two greatest virtues are personal identity and social justice. I'm going to talk more about social justice next week. But I would like to say that your pursuit for fighting and gaining and and, and achieving your personal identity gets in the way of this passage. It gets in the way of being someone who is just giving and generous for the sake of God's glory and the good of others. For personal identity to be something of value, it's something, it must be fought for. It must be chased after. And you need others to affirm you in that pursuit. The mantra for today is love yourself. I've even heard people in the church say, I just got to learn to love myself before I can love God and others. Which seems to me to be the very opposite of the way Jesus describes it. Because when we have to love ourselves first, everything we do is an act of self-affirmation. And we seek others to affirm us as well. Our identity sits on the throne of our hearts and it's no longer Jesus. Our identity is something that we have to defend. It's something we have to fight for. And when we do something good, we need to feed that that affirmation, we need to feed that identity so that we can get the credit for it. 
and young people and those who have, are addicted to it, social media exists to feed your fight for your personal identity. It's the identity that we want to project, that we want others to see in us, whether, whether we see ourselves as that or it's something we just, we want people to see us a certain way. We want to project what our identity should be and therefore we post all of our good works so that others can see how great we are. All of our good actions. We post them up there and we show them so we can get those likes, those affirmations to say, I'm a good person. Look how great I am. And in response, as Christians say, I'm so great, look at me, oh, and, and God is good. It exists so that we can get the affirmation from others of who we are, or at least becoming who we want to be. The beauty about Christianity is, be- is that Christianity is not an identity that we fight for or earn. It's an identity that we're given. It's given to us. It's given to us by faith in Jesus Christ who died on the cross for your sin, your fallenness, your imperfections. And all who come to him and say, Lord, I'm a sinner and you died for sinners. Save me. Take me. He takes you. Whoever seeks him will find him. He's knocking on the door, and if you answer, he will come in. He will give you his identity. He dresses you in his righteousness. He gives you his Holy Spirit so that you're empowered to do his work, his way, for his glory. It is an identity that is given to you. It's not something we have to fight to obtain. It is something we joyfully submit to. Paul says, In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Christianity doesn't proclaim love yourself. It calls us to die to ourselves. Take up our cross and follow Jesus. And those who belong to Christ are not concerned with loving themselves because they're so caught up in the joy of being loved by God, in the reality of having that relationship with Him. They just preoccupy their thoughts with greater things than themselves. They are not lovers of self, they they forget themselves. In the, beauty of, in the beauty of loving Christ and loving others. They're consumed by it. It overflows from them as they share that love with others and all who are around them. It is this love from God that compels them to be givers, to be generous. And in giving, they point up. They point others to look up and they say look how wonderful our savior is look how wonderful jesus is and the reality is whether their works are private whether they're done in secret whether they're done as public they don't notice all they take notice of is jesus as i close this time As we focus on these particular verses, I'll ask the question again. Who are you really serving? Who are you really giving to? There are four questions that I'm going to leave up for your meditation, for your encouragement. If you're meeting together in homes, I encourage you. These are questions to spark conversation. And you can read through those or read them out loud, but the fourth one is the most important one for me today to give you. And in light of this passage, what is God calling you to do? Is he calling you to repent? I've quoted this song often because I sing it often because it ministers to my soul and keeps me accountable. It's a song by William Cooper. And the verse goes, Whatever idol I have known, Whate'er that idol be, help me to tear it from thy throne and worship only thee. 
Let's pray. Lord, we could look at your word and say, good Christian people are generous, and we would all say yes and amen. But Lord, you, in your love, want to get to the heart of the matter because the root problem is not the action, that's the fruit. The root problem is our motives. And our motives are so often tainted and corrupted by our sinful nature. It's the reason you came, Jesus, not to fix our actions, but to fix our hearts, to change our hearts, to give us new hearts, a new life, so that we may be empowered to do the good works that point others to you and worship you and glorify you. Lord, I pray that any moment, every instant where the ego sneaks in, Lord, that we would kill it, we would confess it, we would replace it with the desire of knowing you and being near you and following you. when we are caught up with just loving you above everything else, we don't care if people notice our good deeds because the Father who, who knows, who sees it in secret, he sees it and he has a reward for you in, in his way, in his time. Nobody knows better how to care for us than you, Jesus, to reward us. I pray that you would call to our attention the real reason why we serve you and serve others. And Lord, removing our ego from our service removes so much strife from our church, so much strife from our life, because we're just content in serving the Lord, knowing that you're going to care for us, you're going to reward us. It's about you. Knowing the greatest reward we receive is not something earthly, but one day we will stand face to face with our Savior and we will hear from his lips, well done, well done, good and faithful servant. You did what I called you to do. Oh, Lord, to be with you. Lord, you are our treasure. And we thank you, and I pray that you would convict us of sin. For those who don't know you, Lord, I pray that they would seek out what it really means to have a relationship, a right relationship with Jesus. They would see that the gospel is not just something to know, it's something to respond to. It says that we can't save ourselves. So Jesus, you came down, the Son of God, and you did it for us. And if we just believe you, we take your work, your salvation, you forgive us. If we simply just confess our sins, we come to you as sinners and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. You died for me. I believe it. Save me. We depend on your work for our salvation and we depend on your spirit to do the work in us to change us so that every part of our life is about your glory in the pursuit of you. I thank you and praise you for how your word sharpens us, convicts us, it pierces. Lord, conform us to your will, conform us, shape us to your likeness, Jesus. This I pray, amen.